in the following year, in the year 12 of the Ba'tha, 12 of them from the people of the Ansar, the people of Medina, specifically two from the tribe of Aus and 10 from the tribe of Khazraj, they go to Mecca for the pilgrimage and in a place called the Aqaba. Where's the Aqaba? It's a place in Mina. If you've gone to the Hajj or you've read about the Hajj, the pilgrims, they start the Hajj by going through Mina to Arafat and then where you have the stoning of the devil, where the sheep is slaughtered, that's in a place called Mina. It's right by Mecca, it's not too far from Mecca. In a place in Mina, it's called the Aqaba area. The Prophet was in that area when these people, these 12 people from the Ansar, they meet the Prophet and they give him the following allegiance. They make an allegiance with the Prophet One of those who attended this allegiance, he said, this is the allegiance that we made to the Prophet. Number one, not to ascribe partners to God, no shirk. Number two, we shall not steal. Number three, we shall not commit adultery. Number four, we shall not commit infanticide or killing our children out of fear of poverty because this is something many Arab tribes would do. Out of fear of poverty, they would kill their children. Yes, they would kill them. And their philosophy was, you know, I'm a little bit poor right now, I'm financially struggling, I can't raise my child in the future, or if I die, what's going to happen to my children? There's no one to support them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them in the Holy Quran, I will support you, you and your kids. In a number of verses, Allah prohibits them from killing their children out of poverty or fear of poverty. Allah says, I will take care of them, have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they made this allegiance with the Prophet that they will not kill their children. They will not fabricate lies and accusations. They will not disobey the Prophet And the Prophet told them, if you stay true to this allegiance, to this promise, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you paradise. Otherwise, if you break it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if He decides to forgive you, He can. And if He decides to punish you, then He will punish you. So when they return to Medina, the Prophet sends to them one of his good companions by the name of Mus'ab ibn Umayr. The Prophet sends him to Medina to teach them the Holy Quran because now you had you know, a movement of people in Medina becoming Muslims, so they need someone to educate them about Islam. The Prophet sends them Mus'ab ibn Umayr to teach them the Holy Quran, to teach them the religion of Islam, the laws and rulings of the religion of Islam. Mus'ab ibn Umair was an interesting companion of the Prophet He grew up in Mecca. He was a young, handsome young man. He came from a wealthy family. He would always wear fancy clothes, expensive clothes. He would always put on, you know, the finest perfumes of the time. So he came from a wealthy family. When he heard about the message of the Prophet in the early days of Islam, he decides to meet the Prophet. Where does he meet him? If you remember, we talked about the house of Arqam. When the Prophet in those early years, for about a month or two, he took that as his headquarters and he would privately meet with those Muslims. So he goes to the house of Arqam, which is close to Masjid al-Haram. He meets the Prophet and he becomes a Muslim. But because he feared his family, his tribe would persecute him, he would keep that a secret. He would not openly declare that he was a Muslim. Until one day, a man by the name of Uthman ibn Talha, he saw him, he noticed him praying. So he realized that he had become a Muslim. He goes and he tells on him. He tells his tribe or his family that, you know, your son has become a Muslim and they start to torture him. They imprison him, they torture him until he migrates secretly to the Habasha and that first migration to Abyssinia in order to save himself. So he was truly a great companion of the Prophet 
He was around the age of 40 when he participated in the battles of Badr and Uhud. At the battle of Uhud, he becomes a martyr and a shaheed. And the one who killed him, it's, it's a very sad way in which he died. He, he was carrying the banner of Islam, defending the Prophet at Uhud, when his enemy struck his right arm, he amputated his right arm. So he took the banner in his left arm. He amputated his left arm. So he tried, you know, struggling to carry somehow the, the banner when, you know, he was dealt a, a, a fatal blow and he became a shaheed. So he was truly one of the good companions of the Holy Prophet It has been reported that once the Prophet he saw him coming, you know, after he became Muslim, he lost all that wealth, that special street treatment. His, his parents, especially his mother, she really spoiled him. This is before he became Muslim. When he became a Muslim, he lost all of that. Once the Prophet saw him wearing coarse clothes, I think the hadith says uh, it was made, maybe made from fleece. This is something only poor people would wear or like shepherds would wear. So the Prophet ﷺ, according to this hadith, he looks at him and he says, انظروا إلى هذا الرجل الذي قد نور الله قلبه Look at this man whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has illuminated his heart. The Prophet says, I myself witnessed him come and go with the finest of clothes. But then because of Allah and his messenger, he abandoned all of that and now you see what he's wearing. So the Prophet ﷺ would praise Mus'ab ibn Umair for his sacrifice, for the religion of Islam, for his love, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger of God. Mus'ab ibn Umair, he, went, he goes to Medina, so he's teaching those groups of Muslims the Holy Quran. One of the tribal leaders in Medina, by the name of Sa'd ibn Ma'ath. Does anyone recognize Sa'd ibn Ma'ath from which incident? No. Not the, there's, there's a, a more important incident. We usually hear about it, in the future we'll examine it. You know, the, the, the Jewish massacre. He's the one who actually passed the sentence that you know those uh, uh, Jews no not the ones those who conspired against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa you know they the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa you know according to what we're told he had like 600 or I don't know 400 or 700 Jews killed so he was the one he had he had ties with the Jews so they told the Prophet we won't accept your sentence by the way, had they accepted the Prophet's sentence, he would have forgiven them. They said, let Sa'd, he's a friend of ours, let him decide the, the punishment for us. He's like, I think because of your treason, all the men should be killed. So we'll examine, by the way, this incident. It's a very sensitive incident. Did the Prophet really have 400 or 700 Jews be killed or not? We have a lot of uh, critical points about this incident. So he's famous for that. In any case, Sa'd ibn Ma'ad, he would pass by and he heard Mus'ab ibn Umayyad teaching the people of Medina, this religion, this Qur'an, he becomes furious. He tells them, what is this nonsense that you're learning? And he threatens them. So the people of Medina, the Muslims in Medina, they actually had to go and learn Qur'an secretly. They would go like around a well, secretly gather to hear about the Qur'an. Another time he passed by, he caught them being taught by Mus'ab ibn Umayr. This time, he threatens them. He's like, look, last time you did not take my warning seriously. This time, this time I'm going to beat you up. Stop, what is this new religion that you're preaching? So one of the people present there, he told him, he was his cousin. He tells him, my dear cousin, calm down. Come and listen to this message. If you can refute it, by all means, come and refute it. Just listen to it at least. He's like, okay, let me listen to it. So he listens to the Holy Quran and the teachings. Initially, he did not admit that he found the teachings acceptable. He's like, okay, let me think about it. He goes back home, he thinks about it. 
He finds the religion of Islam the true religion. So he gathers his tribe. His tribe was actually a very important tribe. Banu Abd al Ashham, a very important tribe in Medina. He gathers them and he tells them, What do you think of me? I'm your leader. What do you think of me? They tell him, We regard you very highly. Anything you do, we'll do. If you have any opinion, any suggestion, we're always open to whatever you have to offer. He's like, Okay, if that's how you find me, then I have found the right religion. And I ask you all to embrace the religion of Islam and follow Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Historical accounts tell us nearly all of that family, extended family and tribe, they became Muslim. This was a very big victory for the religion of Islam. And this was the first family to fully support the Prophet in Medina, the family of this person. So he supports now Mus'ab ibn Umair. Now Mus'ab was facing some resistance from, from, from some people in Medina and they threatened him. They told him, look, you can no longer stay here and preach, you better leave. So he seeks refuge in Sa'd ibn Ma'ad. He goes to him and to his tribe. Sa'd tells him, come, come to my tribe, come to my area and you can freely preach the religion of Islam and that's what he does. So we see this growing movement in Medina supporting the message of the Prophet and becoming Muslims. This trend continued until nearly almost every family from the Ansar in Medina had a few members who had converted to the religion of Islam. So we see this growing movement in Medina to support the Prophet It is also reported that Mus'ab ibn Umair was the first one who led the Friday prayer in Islam. The Prophet in Mecca, he could not lead the Friday prayer because of the persecution of the Meccans. They would not allow him to congregate and do the Friday prayer. So according to some hadiths, when he sent Mus'ab ibn Umair to Medina, he gave him the instruction to gather on Friday with the men and women and to pray two rakahs. Now this was the original form of the Friday prayer, you know, without a sermon and the speech in its early stages. Then the Prophet ﷺ expanded on it. But initially the Friday prayer was just a turaka, just like the morning prayer that you pray at noon on Friday. So the Prophet ﷺ does give him that instruction. Now some have objected to this by saying Surah to Jum'ah was revealed when the Prophet migrated to Medina. At this time when the Prophet was in Mecca, there was no Salat to Jum'ah, so how can we accept these accounts? We don't really consider this a valid objection, why? Because Surah Al-Jum'ah does not say that from today Allah has mandated Salat Al-Jum'ah. In fact, there are indications in the verse that Salat Al-Jum'ah was prayed regularly before Surah Al-Jum'ah was revealed. Which verse gives you that indication? It talks about a habit some companions would have while the Salah was being established. See Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, idha nudiya lil salati min yawm al jum'ah, when you are called to pray on Friday, fas'aw ila dhikrillah, race, go to the remembrance of Allah, wa dharul bay, stop doing business transactions. You know those very companions, they would abandon salat al jum'ah. Yes, until Allah had to reveal a verse exposing them and reprimanding them. In fact, if you look at historical accounts, once the Prophet in Medina prayed Salat al Jum'ah, and the only people who attended was Ali salam, Imam Hassan and Hussein and Fatima. Everybody else was busy with their business transactions. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rebuked them for that. So when Allah revealed Surah al Jum'ah, it seems that Salat al Jum'ah already was being prayed. So Allah rebuked them for not going to Salat al Jum'ah and being busy with, with their business transactions. So in any case, we do have historical accounts that the Prophet told Mus'ab ibn Umair to pray Salat al-Jum'ah on Friday at noon in Medina. So we could argue that this was the first Friday prayer in the religion of Islam. It was established in Medina with the leadership of Mus'ab ibn Umair.